truths to be self-evident. That all men are created. As a member of Congress, I get to have a lot of really interesting people in the office. Experts on what they're talking about. This is the podcast for insights into the issues. China, bioterrorism, Medicare for all. In-depth discussions. Breaking it down into simple terms. We hold. We hold. We hold these truths. We hold these truths. With Dan Crenshaw. The eagle has landed. Well-armed, they're well-funded, they have anti-aircraft weapons, they arm off-the-shelf drones to scout and attack each other and their enemies. They improvise 4 by 4s with armor and machine guns. They're brutal. They commit public executions and have no hesitation to display their victims in public to intimidate the, the opposition and their fellow population. I'm not talking about the Islamic State, I'm talking about the Mexican drug cartels. They're responsible for around 80,000 American deaths from fentanyl every year, more than 4.7 million encounters at the border, over a million gotaways at the border, $14 billion a year from human trafficking, and wide-scale corruption of public officials. They're destabilizing our southern neighbor, Mexico. They have operational control of our southern border, and they use that control to traffic people and drugs into our country. They're at war with us, whether we want to accept it or not. And joining me today is someone who has been at war with them for years. Uh, Ed Calderon was a police officer in Tijuana and worked for over a decade in counter-narcotics, organized crime investigations, and public safety in the northern border region of Mexico. Ed has shared his expertise with members of federal law enforcement agencies, including the FBI, uh, the CBP, Navy SEALs, Mexican and United States intelligence service agents, and members of special forces groups from all over the world. Ed, thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much for this invitation. It's an honor. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, reading that bio uh, quickly about you, it's how are you still alive? <laughs> what <is that? laughs> uh, you know, it's uh, I tried to kill myself a few times with alcohol and just uh, taking horrible jobs, but that's about it. You know, um, <laughs> how am I still alive? Uh, I had pretty good uh, mentoring and leadership. Um, they kind of uh, put me on the path. Uh, I'd say, uh, there's a very influential figure in my in my life uh, by the name of Lieutenant Colonel Lizaola. Uh, he's a pretty legendary figure in Mexico, one of those uncorruptible guys. He got, had uh, nine assassination attempts on his life, and uh, you know the last one took the use of his legs. But uh, he's still he's still around. Um, with leadership like that, I think uh, that's what kept me alive for all that time. Yeah, I mean, well, that's uh, that's like a motivational factor for sure. But I mean, you you, you hear about. Uh, police officers in, in Mexico, just uh, judges, anyone who's incorruptible, as you say, uh, that that that's a threat to the cartels, and and they come after you, they come after your family. Um, I mean, I, I guess let, let's just maybe we just need to start from the beginning because I'm just, I'm curious sure. about your your story. I, I want to get a, I want sure. I want a lot of ground truth on the cartels themselves. Sure, but but I'm, I'm I think people are curious too about your story. Um, and I'll, let me read a little bit about it. Uh, if, if there's anything I didn't get to already, um, cause I think some of this is interesting and then let's just let's start with like where you were born, why you speak English so well, <laughs> um, and, uh, and just, and just how you got into this business at all. So, like I said before, you're a police officer, counter narcotics, organized crime investigations, um, public safety, Northern border region of Mexico. Uh, you, you've coordinated protection details for high-level government officials, visiting dignitaries, things like that. Uh, this is in, this is this caught my eye, and um, and I want to talk to you about it later. Sure. A, a, you studied indigenous Mexican criminal culture from occult practices to endemic modus operandi. You've led them to be recognized as one of the world's uh, preeminent researchers and trainers in the field of personal security that, that's come out of Mexico. Uh, like I said before, you, you you deal with a lot of different agencies and groups all over the world. Um, uh, you, you do consulting, you do uh, seminars, private training courses and anti-abduction, escapology. I didn't know that was a word, but it sounds cool. Um, unarmed combat, uh, region-specific executive protection work and unconventional edged weapons work. Okay, I want to know what that is too. All right, sure. so that, that's a pretty cool background. But I mean, how, how did this even start? Where, where are, you, are you originally from Tijuana? I was born and raised in Tijuana. I was uh, born, born on 7th Street in El Centro. Uh, it's rare to be born in Tijuana. Like even growing up in school, everybody would uh, raise their hands as far as who's from Tijuana. Tijuana yeah. is a, a city of immigrants, so it, it's it's kind of weird or rare to have people that are born there. Yeah. My parents are from Guadalajara. They moved to Tijuana, basically looking for a better life. Uh, they didn't try to they didn't try to go to the United States. They actually came to work in Tijuana. Tijuana is a is a pretty big place with a lot of opportunities. Um, 
uh, growing up uh, in Tijuana, it's basically a border town, so English is in the environment. It's a yeah. it's a very Americanized city. Uh, you if you don't know how to speak English, you can't get a job. So uh, most of my conversational English comes from that. And then uh, later on, going through training, I had to go through language school to try and get rid of the accents. So I can talk to people over the phone and have conversations, you know, for work, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and and talk to people. Uh, in some of the touristy town, uh, touristy areas and towns of Baja, uh, where you know drug related and organized crime related stuff was happening, so basically to play the part of a, an American in some of these places, that's where I got my conversational uh, English. Yeah, and, uh, and and then when did you join the police force? Is that something you always <laughs> wanted to do? Yes. Yeah. No. Hell no. <laughs> uh, I was a punk rock kid. You know, I had all the. Uh, the the f the police uh, stuff on my patches and stuff like that you know yeah. uh, was into was into street art graffiti uh, skateboarding um, all that stuff and uh, 9-11 happened and basically took uh, most of the economy into the toilet including my my uh, father's business and he was the one that was financially supporting me in my career path to become a doctor uh, I was in medical school for a bit and uh, that kind of ended. Uh, Early 2000s, not a lot of opportunities. And I see this ad in the newspaper wanting unmarried men, uh, young, below 30, that don't have any kids that are willing to join this experimental uh, state police force in, 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 in Baja, a militarized paramilitary type uh, group that they were forming. Hmm. Uh, <clears throat> my family said, you don't have the balls. And uh, six months later, I was on a bus uh, uh, heading to this uh paramilitary training compound that they had set up inside of a for, uh, former prison. And uh, wow. away we went on this uh, wild adventure. Okay. So is that, is that um, th there's, there's differentiation in Mexico as far as police forces, local police, federal police. Is this a Mex is this a federal? It's a, it, it was a, it was a state, uh, it was a state agency that uh, basically was, made under uh, more of a federalized plan they were trying to figure out how to uh how to get the military into the fight so uh, a lot of the first things we did when we went out to work was have a truck loaded with a bunch of uh army soldiers dressed in gray the first uh the first version of the federal police basically mm -hmm. uh be basically being led around or guided by the local state agents which we were uh a lot of the training was basically paramilitary to make make us match uh, operationally with the uh, with the army that we're trying to get into the fight. Basically, back then, this is this is right before the kickoff of the major drug war uh, in during the tenure of uh, Felipe Calderon. Okay, so maybe that's a good place to start. Actually, it's a little bit of history in Mexico as far as when these cartels started to become powerful. Like there's there's this shift and everybody knows it now because they watch Netflix and they watch Narcos. But uh, for those of us who've been following it for a little bit longer than that, uh, the, obviously the powerful cartels were in Colombia and and they were decimated, um, you know, through well Colombian and, and American operations over time. Um, they they kind of transformed into sort of a guerrilla warfare, a, a, a different kind of entity, similar but different. Um, and. And uh, Mexican drug cartels uh, over time became more powerful. Can, can you give us some history on that? Um, uh, and, and which 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 administrations in Mexico sought to to take this battle on? Which ones didn't? Yeah. And 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 then what your unit like what what this unit you're talking about is called is when we say in, in colloquial American English, you know, the federales. Is that was that what we're talking about here? No, no, the federales came after. <laughs> uh, so colloquially, we were basically Baja state agents. Uh, okay. so state police, uh, but the, you know, not state police in, in the United States is very much a law enforcement community policing arm. We're very much operational, basically militarized. That's why the, the paramilitary training was behind us. Uh, the guys that were in charge of our training were all former members of the GAFE. The GAFE was, uh, where basically that's where the, uh, Zetas originated from the, uh, the, uh, the special forces units that, uh, deserted and turned themselves into a first a bodyguarding team for one of the major Gulf cartels and then a cartel to the uh, in and of themselves. Uh, these were some of the, some of the members of that unit were basically the one that trained us. Uh, so the, 
as far as the history goes, I can I can speak of it uh, during my experience in time. Sure. Basically, I, I started off uh, during the tenure of the president Felipe, uh, uh, no President Fox, Vicente Fox, who was the first president to gain the presidency uh, from the rival party, uh, the PAN, which is a conservative party. Mexico had a, had a, had been under the rule of the PRI party for for almost uh, almost ninety years uh, at this point. Uh, uh, and corruption was, you know, at the top of the list of, of things that they wanted to take care of. Uh, but, you know, like all things in Mexico, uh, be, be, very good intentions, but very, very, very uh, poorly thought out. And uh, a lot of corruption came in with the new administration as well. Cartels took advantage of this uh, sort of change in, uh, in in administration. What year? What year were we talking here? 2000. Okay. So the 2000 era. You you see with the you see with the, with the presidential uh, tenures in Mexico, uh, a period of, five, of six to five years where they come in, do everything they need to do, and everything gets basically canned and restarted again. Every presidential tenure that comes, if anything has any sort of inkling of success from the past administration, that's bad for business and bad for our current administration. So everything gets uh, gets uh, canned. So you saw this pro, uh, pro- progression into the the uh, Felipe Calderon administration, where he basically just militarized this whole drug war, uh, and had some pretty nefarious people under his uh, administration, basically taking care of uh, a public safety on a federal level. Um, you have uh, Marta Luna, who is currently on trial in New York for uh, his cartel ties and and basically taking money from these uh, or criminal organizations. He was the one that was in charge of uh, back then while I was uh, active. He was the, in charge of all the programs to keep us honest. You know, <laughs> he was in charge of all these, uh, uh, we call them uh, C3 programs where all of the agents would be put into polygraph checks, FBI background checks, uh, uh, financial checks, uh, surprise house visits. They would come to our houses and, you know, just look around and ask why we had uh, two TVs instead of one, that type of thing, which, you know, kept kept the group uh, clean uh, and kept some of these groups clean. But it's surprising now that to learn that the person in charge of all of that federally at the high level uh, was compromised and was uh, receiving money from the Viltron Leva cartel. Um, this, uh, this, the, the, and the, the, the flowering of the Sinaloa cartel in this in this in this period, early two thousands, uh, how it gained control over most of the historically uh, Tijuana cartel controlled border region, uh, basically the corridor to one of the largest drug markets on the planet, which is California. Uh, this is the, this this time the, these two factions warred with each other, and the Sinaloa cartel eventually came up on top in a way and controlled that area. Uh, basically having the keys into the United States and controlling most of the more sought after uh, parts of the border on the northwestern side of uh, Mexico. Uh, you saw the uh, blossoming of the Zeta cartel uh, and a lot of the uh, destruction and chaos that it created, uh, basically upping the stakes and upping the, what they're capable of, what cartels were capable of as far as violence. I mean, the Zeta cartel is basically one of the... Uh, the, one of the groups that introduce some of the aspects of guerrilla warfare that remind me very much of uh, IRA type uh, methodologies and tactics when it comes to improvised explosives, armored vehicles, uh, uh, mortars, uh, IEDs uh, being utilized by some of these cartel forces. Uh, so the Sinaloa cartel saw a lot of pressure and, 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 and uh, threat from them. So what they did is basically they formed their own uh, modeled guerrilla force uh, Zeta type cartel to counter these these groups. This is in the early 2000s uh, during the Felipe Calderon administration. Uh, and what you saw there was violence obviously exploded. Uh, you, you're fighting fire with fire. So now you're seeing a compromised federal police force and military working for, in some cases, one or the other side of this uh, drug war, uh, uh, basically working for one of the cartels in, in, in a lot of ways, as far as the influence they had and people they arrested. Uh, 
And then this leads to the birth of the new generation cartel, which was founded by members of this Mata Zeta or uh, Zeta killers group that the Zinalar cartel formed. A highly militarized, uh, formed by a former police agent, actually, uh, by the name of Nevesio Seguera Cervantes, who had a keen eye for organization and a very interesting way of selecting and training the people that were going to basically lead this uh, expansion force that is now currently taking control over the majority of uh, some of these uh, major hubs for growing, distributing, and uh, trafficking uh, fentanyl and uh, and some of these other fentanyl-related uh, products up into the United States. You know, um, one question I have, too, is on, on the history side of things is uh america's involvement in this um what, what's your experience with what we call the merida initiative sort of the mexican version of plan colombia i'm, I'm very familiar with plan colombia i, I used yeah. to live in colombia so like i i was i was in bogota during 1998 to 2002 kind of the height of guerrilla warfare uh the cartels weren't a subject that we talked about very much in, in colombia um i think by that point it sort of transitioned to mexico and yeah and um and so, but Plan Colombia was a very successful foreign policy initiative. Uh, There's a few factors there, which was which was the fact that the Colombian government was extremely cooperative, very corrupt, just like the Mexican government is. But they battled it. I mean, they just they battled it out. And there's there's still problems, of course. But um, a lot of people would say it's a it's a huge success story. Yeah. Um, the Merida, the Merida initiative, from my perspective, was just never as uh, the, the cooperation was never there to the same extent. What causes that? <laughs> what, 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 oh. Is it is it because of the administration? Is it the Mexican people don't like us very much? <laughs> like, what's the what's the what's the issue there? So, so from my perspective, I was actually a recipient of a lot of that uh, support that the United States sent down to Mexico. Uh, I was trained in uh, Coronado by uh, members of the uh, uh NSW and uh, some NCIS uh, agents. Yeah. Um, uh, I received training from Americans coming down and basically showing us how to apply tourniquets and how to figure out how to patrol urban areas. People that were coming off uh, operations in Afghanistan and Iraq uh, were right. showing us how to operate uh, doing police work in Mexico. It was funny that war fighters were showing us better than some police officers that we were trained with, you know. Um, it uh, for a while it seemed to be work, you know. It seemed to bolster uh, the quality of agents being produced, uh, the professionalism which some of these uh, people were going to be put through. Um, certifications like the police certification Kalia, uh, where actually my unit uh, went through that American police certification and we passed. So there was there was some successes, uh, but then when you look at it deeper, and I, I think I encountered some of this when I when I was uh, put in charge of a protection detail, uh, I had to procure armored vehicles for this protection detail uh, and procure some equipment. And I saw myself barred from actually being able to choose or pick certain equipment. So basically it was money destined for that, uh, for these, uh, for these uses, but it was specifically tied to very specific companies and people that were basically had an agreement with the government to take yeah. that money. So uh, 22 aircraft uh, were sent down from the United States as part of this uh, media initiative all the way to 2021, I think, uh, $1.6 billion. Uh, and uh, you can, if the if Americans would want to come down and basically do an audit of uh, uh, where all that money went, uh, I'd be very interested to to see what they find. Uh, of the twenty two aircrafts, I, I don't I don't see a lot of them remaining. Um, I don't see a lot of the uh, a, a lot of the money spent on vehicles, training, uniforms, also training of a whole federal police force that is now completely gone. Uh, really? what you see now. What you see now, the 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 people dressed in blue mm -hmm. that you used to see the the federalists as the as federalists as you used to uh, as Americans like calling them, they're gone. Uh, their uh, their infrastructure dismantled, their training dismantled, their leadership dismantled uh, as part of uh, again this whole cycle of amnesia that uh, the Mexican government gets every single federal pres presidency. This current president uh, uh, Lopez Obrador 
horrible one. Uh, uh, very to the left of the political spectrum, open Chavista, yeah. open Maduro supporter. Uh, at the start of his presidency, he said, basically, there is no drug war. Uh, hugs, not uh, hot, hugs, not bullets. Right. And I'm not going to make Abrazos, the same mistake. No balazos, right? Yeah. And I'm not <laughs> going to make better. It sounds better in Spanish. <laughs> and, and I'm not going to make the same mistake as my predecessor, Felipe Calderon, and also his basically enemy. Uh, and uh, he basically did exactly the same thing. Uh, it was to me was mind boggling that uh, I was seeing army personnel dressed in a new uniform in the back of trucks patrolling cities as a new implementation of a security policy, which is exactly what I did when I went out to work back in 2004. We we're basically driving around a bunch of military personnel in the back of a truck and everybody knew where we were. Everybody knew where they were and everybody would give them a wide berth because these people have eyes and ears everywhere. Uh, Cartels are evolving constantly in the ways they communicate, they work, how they recruit, how they train, because they're, they are training. Um, and meanwhile, the federal government's solution to that is putting people on the back of trucks uh, in and, uniform. And so, and so I mean, what around. you're telling me is, and this is very frustrating, you're telling me there's there, there has not been a consistent and evolving uh, counter operation this whole time because of politics, basically. Every five years, they take all the money that the United States sends down there, which I think, according to what I read, was one point six billion. Mm -hmm. uh, every every five years, they take all that money, all of the investments made in equipment, people, and personnel training, all that, and basically toss it into the fire. That's what's and then, been yeah, happening. Yeah, start over just just to say that they they're doing something new. Uh, that the, the last guy didn't know what he was doing, and here we go. Yeah, I mean, we're obviously familiar with that kind of politics here. Um, it doesn't it obviously doesn't go to that great of an extent. Um, it, There's it's, just Im, Im, imagine somebody blowing up the FBI offices and and yeah, firing every everybody, firing everybody there, firing everybody at the academy, and then just starting over. That's exactly what happens in Mexico. Um, and uh, you're starting to see a very scary militarization, or the military is very much in control of everything in Mexico right now, as far as not just security, because uh, they've been doing a lot, bunch of changes in law, 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 changing a bunch of laws as far as uh, their presence or their ability to patrol and, and arrest people. Uh, but now they're getting involved in contracts related to infrastructure. So they're building airports, uh, yeah, it's train wild. lines. Um, and if you want to, if, if people want to figure out the, the level of power that the military has in Mexico right now, uh, back in 2001, the United States arrested a, a general by the name of Cienfuegos. Cienfuegos, uh, according to the DOJ, had they had a lot of evidence on him as far as him having conversations with cartel members and being somebody that was basically aiding and abetting some of these criminal groups in Mexico. Uh, they dropped all charges and sent him back to Mexico to be judged and tried in Mexico. And what they did was drive him to his house. Jeez. Uh, is, it a so, is it a cartel member or a corrupt government official? He's a, he was the basically he was the uh, the, the the head of the the head of the national safety and national security in Mexico. He's a general, basically. Jesus, he was our. Geez. He was yeah. And, and, so and is this that is a nickname? This, is, is sorry, <laughs> random question. Is that a nickname, San Fuegos, or is that a no? Is that, that's, that's, that's his that's, last that's his, name. Okay, that's his last name. Uh, so basically, they uh, dropped all charges, sent him back to Mexico. The army says thank you, and. And president, the, the president says want. they're, they're going to investigate him, but they don't, you know, because realistically, the arm is the one that's in power in Mexico, not not the president. And and, and at, at that level, it was a very much a show of force as far as how it's, powerful the, the army is now. And and you know, I, I need to talk to my own people about this as well. But I mean, is, do, do you see any signs of anything resembling a Merida initiative at this point? I mean, do we have anyone to work with? If this was made a priority by our own administration, by the Biden Biden administration, do we have feasible partners to work with at this point? I, I know we do to an extent. I mean, I we 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 there is still some intel sharing. There's 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 a question, of course, of who we give that to and who yeah. we can trust. Like, how I mean, do we how do we how do we navigate this? It's interesting. Historically, you were you had seen the tip of the spear as far as counter cartel operations, as far as the military goes, in the hands of the Mexican Marines. Uh, yeah. They they were involved in the raid on El Chapo. Uh, they had a few high level uh, high level operations. Apparently, the United States had trusted them and was kind of basically sharing a lot of information and cross training with them. 
but in the recent operations that you saw against uh, Oviedo, uh, El Chapo Guzman's son, you see the army now uh, being front and center. Interesting change. Uh, you see a denial of them and the president as far as them receiving any sort of support or uh, intelligence from the United States for that operation. Uh, you see, you see an open, uh, almost uh, disdain for any sort of uh, government intervention in, in Mexico. That specifically the DEA, uh, uh, from all intents and purposes, they're very much. Uh, People that are not welcomed in Mexico and a lot of the in, in a lot of these circles now, uh, information sharing, you know, yeah. you, be what you it Amer is. You mean, you mean American agencies? Yeah, yeah. yeah. This, it's basically the doors are closed. Uh, the policy with them is not to, that you know to don't trust the Americans. It's the and, whole and why? Why is narrative. that? Because that's that, that that's certainly the the impression I get. Again, I, I don't have a ton of experience in Mexico. I I, I understand South American culture pretty well. Um, uh, there's there's a long history between the U.S. and Mexico, and it's good and bad, right? And and uh, I, I don't know if this is uh, a myth or not, but you know the 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 myth goes like this: the word "gringo" came from this uh, uh, sort of a, a para from a um, what's what's the right word when something sounds like something and it becomes a word. But anyway, it was it was from uh, Mexican citizens spray painting "green go," referring to the American army. I don't know to this day if that's a myth or not, but it's always where I've heard the origin of that word gringo. Um, and so there's there's a there's a history there. Um, and there's 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 sort of a, a, a native pride, uh, a, a nationalism in Mexico that that, that wants to, that seeks to keep us out in the way that was present a little bit because it's present everywhere in Latin America. But it was it's not as much so in places like Colombia. Um, yeah. And they allowed much more cooperation, invited much more cooperation, celebrated that cooperation. And we, we just can't seem to get to that point in Mexico. Is, it, is that is that politics or is that is that the Mexican people? I mean, what are we doing wrong here? How do we fix this? I think, uh, you know, on our end, when we were when I was operational and working, I remember finding out about Fast and the Furious on on CNN, basically watching the news Uh at high levels in government, there was some sort of rift created at that moment when uh, they found out about some of these operations that were happening uh, really? in Mexico. I, I can I can trace back at least some of the hostility or the kind of mental betrayal aspect of, of things to that point in the past. Um, the obviously Mexico has a long history with the United States and some of the. Uh, it, it being a hub for the United States uh, and Russia during the 60s, basically trying to go back and forth. Fidel Castro trained and prepared his uh, his uh, guerrilla warfare expedition to Cuba in Mexico. Um, so it's it's always Mexico has always been a hub for a lot of activity. Um, surprisingly, right now, like in places like Baja, 90 percent of all new housing is being bought up by Americans. Yeah. There are a lot of Americans all over Mexico and uh it's interesting that there's, there's this anti-American sentiment uh, mentality uh, kind of under the surface. Uh, Trump, the Trump administration did a lot of damage with some of the, uh, the rhetoric and the wording uh, during the campaigns. And uh, a lot of that is now being felt in high level poli the politics in Mexico, where it's popular to, you know, to call a stop to American expansionism or interventionism. And I think you can trace it back to the, the Trump administration as far as how it's now popular to view the United States as the bad guys. You know, that's something that I just perceived from uh, talking to some of the people in Mexico. Um, the the uh, the view uh, that uh, a lot of people get, you know, is we're living through a populist leftist presidency uh, where you can see open support of uh, Vladimir Putin, for example, or people mocking, uh, mocking uh, certain elements or uh, elements of the uh, the U.S. administration right now and, and their intervention in the Ukraine. It's like popular to talk about it and kind of make fun of it and poke at it. You can see it in the social media. Hmm. Um, where does this come from? We have a history. It's like both of, a, both of these countries have a history uh, between each other. Um, and it's funny because we're tied by blood and now by people living on both sides of the border in a very close fashion. So it, uh, in a lot of ways, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't. Uh, you can't you can't survive without the other. I mean, <laughs> you know, 
it's 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 wild anyway i didn't want to mean, mean to cut it's, you off it's, it's i mean we're we're uh we uh when you see china going the way it's going economically i think it's gonna it's gonna go bad pretty in the next five six years i guess and the, the, according to what i know yeah uh you see in mexico a very powerful trading partner uh you see uh a young country with a lot of people willing to work that are just screaming exactly. for opportunities uh uh, the pace is pretty strong right now. I think it has something to do with the investments coming in that are leaving China and going into Mexico. You have very, very skilled labor there. You have a, uh, you have a, uh, you have a lot of resources. You have a lot mm-hmm. of people. You know, this is, this is who the United States is going to look to for support in the coming, you know, whatever's coming. You know, I 100 percent agree with with that with all of what you just said, and. Um... And I'm well aware of the kind of the undertones, again, just having myself grown up in Latin America, not necessarily in Mexico, but Latin America is Latin America. And um, 100% agree, too, with the idea that the, Mexico is such a strategic partner for us, um, for all the reasons you just stated. Maybe maybe we're reading the same things um, about China and about uh, the potential in Mexico, the resources you spoke about, the demographics are an extremely important part of this, the being, being, I think Mexico has the healthiest demographics in the world. As far as a, a young population, just at the right levels, we we're 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 not quite Europe in America, but we're we're we're, we're teetering on that. It depends on how millennials do with having kids. We'll we'll see. We're working on it. All right, <laughs> that's that's. Uh, I guess you're. Are you, we're, we seems to be we're about the same age. Uh, you're, how old are you? I just turned forty this year. Yeah, so we're about the same yeah. age. I've, I've turned thirty nine yeah. in, in a month. So. Um, you know, all, everything you just said is is, is spot on. And, um, you know, it, it's one of the reasons I'm so intent on tackling the cartels. I view the cartels as destabilizing a country that we badly, badly need. Uh, you know, I, I can't control their crazy politics. I can't control what Obrador does and these, these far left pop, this far left populism. I mean, Colombia just elected a far left populist, you know, and, and, and we've we've been monitoring this for years in Mexico, at least with with AMLO. Uh, trying to figure out what that means economically. And so far, it doesn't appear to mean that they're going the way of Venezuela, but it doesn't mean it's good either. They're certainly not growing into a thing that we need them to grow in. He seems to be very much against foreign direct investment while also still allowing it. So in, in, I'm always trying to parse out the, the populist rhetoric from the reality is I'm assured by my Colombian friends, because uh, I do keep in very close contact with a lot of them, that that it's a lot of rhetoric in Colombia, and it won't translate to a lot of devastating left wing policy, which yeah. which which makes me feel better. What, yeah. what, do you, what is your assessment in Mexico of that? Uh, the, the current administration will, you know, the peso is pretty strong right now. Uh, investment is high. Uh, I think the peso has been stable for about two years. It's uh, it's a, it's a pretty strong currency. Uh, they will they, the current administration will say that it's because of their policies. It's probably because of investments coming from afar, fleeing places that, uh, like China, that are no longer friendly or, or, or viable for their businesses. Uh, you see a lot of rhetoric. Uh, it's very popular to call, you know, uh, the call the United States the evil empire uh, right now in Mexico. Um, they're go- we're going through a woke wave uh, in Mexico as well. I mean, this whole uh, gender pronouns are now being you know, talked about in schools and stuff like that in Mexico, does, which is why. How does that, how does that work in the Spanish language? <laughs> it, uh, like, uh, it blows my mind because the Spanish, obviously the Spanish language for those who don't know is, 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 is every word is either feminine or masculine. Every single word. <laughs> so it's just, it, uh, I, 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 I first learned about gender pronouns uh, by talking in a university somewhere in California, uh, probably three years ago. And I was dumbfounded, man. I'm I'm new to this country. I'm probably five years into my American dream myself. So I was trying to get accustomed to them in the United States, and all of a sudden, yeah. they started popping up in Mexico. Um, the uh, I, I don't know. Where the, where, this, where where do you live? Uh, Kentucky. You? Kentucky. Kentucky. Okay. I thought you were going to yeah. say San Diego or something. No. <laughs> like, uh, Kentucky. There you go. Oh, it's a it's a good place. You know. Yeah, uh, it's a great place. A, it's absolutely it's a, beautiful. If, Kentucky. If people. If people want uh, good tacos in Louisville, uh, you just have to, you know, people, the people that take care of the horses around the, the derby, you know, they'll, they'll know. Yeah. Just, just <laughs> go around. Now, now, if you want good tacos, uh, Texas is the best place. The Tex-Mex is, is by far the best, I think. And I've, and I've, and I've lived in California a long time too. They've got, it's got their own style, but uh, I'm just, I'm just going to th- throw it out there for Texas. 
uh, as Anthony Bourdain said once, if people want a culinary experience in California, cross the border into Tijuana and you'll get it. Yeah. Well, the, the street tacos, the street tacos south of the border, that, that's the only place you can get them. It's, it has to be in Mexico. I, I grew up in Tijuana and I'm spoiled, you know, I'm spoiled. Yeah. <laughs> but but uh, the, uh, I'd say the, uh, the overall rhetoric, rhetoric you see in Mexico right now is basically it's popular to be anti-America right now. It's yeah, well, it's, po- it's 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 popular in our colleges here too. Yeah, um, and it's it, it's frustrating. Uh, hell, it's it's popular. You know, it's it's weird how these kind of far left and far right nexus is they start to combine. It starts the, the the political spectrum starts to become a circle where they kind of meet in the middle, and you know this sort of like pro-Putin, anti-Ukraine rhetoric, it appears in the far, far right and the in the far, far left. And, and you know, I, I think to a certain extent, sometimes it's just people want to be contrarians. I, I'm not sure that that they're that they're they're, they're much more um, uh, well thought out than that. Uh, it, and it's frustrating. Uh, OK, so we've gotten a pretty good picture here of the and I and I, and we, I wanted to spend some time on that is, is giving the audience a, an overall picture of relations with Mexico, Mexican culture, uh, a, a little bit of, of Mexican history with us and internally, all of that. Uh, we could probably talk about it for hours more, um, but I do want to get into some details on your experiences with the cartels themselves um, and 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 what that's like on a daily basis. I mean, what, what those operations are like, how do you collect on them? How do you, how do you decide when an operation is worth it? Um, how do you know that these, these folks are actually going to go to jail if you put them there? Are you playing whack-a-mole? I mean, so, so, you know, do, do you just take one out and another one replaces them and it just feels like it's this never ending problem. And, you know, and what's, what's the, what is the, the, the population of Mexico? What, what is, what is the people's stance on this? Yeah. Do they like that AMLO basically has a ceasefire with the cartels do, yeah. or, or, or do they think that this is going to devastate their country over time and that we'd actually need to take the fight to them? Was, I mean, like it just the uh, the reality of it. Imagine going into as a federal agent or as a state agent going into a city and realizing that the municipal police is on the payroll of one cartel, the army is on the payroll of another, and uh, maybe the marines, uh, the Mexican marines units are on the payroll of another or under different interests. So everybody has a side, basically. Um, and the way things work in Mexico, money goes up, you know, and orders and shit come down, is what we say. Uh, and so you 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 go into a room, get a briefing, and you'll get a target package of you know four houses and maybe a few pictures of some people that you need to get. Uh, but you don't know anything other than the fact that those are the people that were just des- de- designated or, or uh, sent out to get or, and, and houses where you're supposed to hit. But when you start spreading out all these operations, you start realizing that they're all orientated towards one side of the conflict, basically. And then you realize that even though you're not uh, you're not part of you're not in on the joke, you're part of the joke in a way. Um, this, these are places where the locals and the neighborhood is on the side of the cartels mm-hmm. because they're their sons and their daughters work for them. Uh, we had this uh, one time we were uh, working in this uh community um everybody there was basically in the know uh, so every time anybody foreign from that area would be in there they, they, everybody would know we would hear the radio shatter like somebody's here there's a weirdo here and they would take pictures and they would have these pictures there so everybody knew who who, who we were um old ladies would drive around this car we thought they were uh, selling tamales and a uh, cooler it turns out that they were the ones that were drive to the sicarios and hand over the firearms and the vest, they would use them and then they would hand them back to these old ladies, put them in the back of their car and just drive off. So they were basically a roll, uh, roving armory for these people. Um, and uh, you would get there and the streets that you were patrolling were you know, paved by some of these criminal organizations. Um, the uh, hospitals were that you would rush people to uh, when the, uh, when the, uh, the emergencies hit; uh, those were owned by some of them as well. So it's, it's uh, pretty uh, demoralizing and debilitating as far as the complexity and how intertwined everything is. Um, our information was supposed to be secret, and they would we would find uh, 
files on um, emergency contact numbers on each of us in places where it shouldn't be found. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's insane. It's an, it's an insane place to work. Uh, very demoralizing, very debilitating. And uh, people like myself would go into this line of work, get all this training, get all this experience and then get offers. You know, uh, uh, the last time I was act when I was active and I got an offer, it was in the vicinity of $8,000 every two weeks to work for one of these criminal organizations. Uh, plus, you know, whatever benefits that uh, brings with it, which is probably not life insurance and probably not living to C40. But uh, and a lot of people took that offer. Uh, so imagine that the people that you were working with uh, and you were having a lot of successes with are now compromised and are off doing their stuff on the other side. So it's even more dangerous. Uh, and there's nobody really there to trust which is a big factor in when why a lot of these uh uh organizations and police groups and uh, associations and all of these things basically don't last uh they don't have the longevity that some of these criminal enterprises do uh they just uh they just get dissolved from the inside out what uh i mean what makes you refuse that kind of offer i mean is uh, it some some sense of higher calling some sense of duty i mean what is it <laughs> I, I, I wish I could tell you it's my mom that raised me right. You know, she, she did. She's a Catholic and everybody laugh with Latin people in the, in, in, in the United States that uh, they talk about the, the mother getting the sandal out, la chancla. My mom had a car antenna in her closet. That's what I would get if I did anything stupid. Um, I mean, a little bit, I did get some morality from her, but specifically it's the, the, when I first started, I saw all of the people that were on the take mm -hmm. and none of them made it past two years. So I just knew that it's suicide. Once you get on the take and you're working for one side or the other, you're eventually, eventually somebody's going to find out and either you'll be arrested or you'll be killed because killed, killed by uh, who? By government if, uh, or, 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 if, or if, rival if, gangs or. If I'm working for one cartel as an inside informant in one of the police agencies, somebody's going to find out about that on the rival side of the cartels and I'm going to yeah. get it. That's how it happens. I'm not saying that everybody in these groups uh, were corrupted, but a lot of them were. Uh, I'd say like over half of them were. Um, I, had, I was lucky because I didn't have a family to support. I didn't have a kid to worry about. And I was very much punk rock in my kind of a uh, state of mind and being, and I was there just for the for the for the for the thrill of it Thrills, in a lot of yeah. ways. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't see myself living past thirty. I buried a lot of friends, uh, and I saw a lot of people come and go. Uh, but I I, I just uh, I didn't want to get I don't go I don't want I don't want to go that way. Uh, what so so they know do they know where you live? I mean, as, as your operators, your your, your standard back back then i was uh living in army barracks uh, i was living uh at the police academy for a bit uh okay. uh and hotels and just moved around a lot which is kind of what i still do <laughs> kind of the way i'm living still to this day um so yeah. a lot of us again i think the reasoning why a lot of us were unmarried and didn't have any kids was to be able to do that type of stuff and kind of be moved around but in that way okay so uh, there was, it wasn't even an option to, to have a home it would, no. it would be suicide. No. And when I finally made that choice, it, uh, the, the, the pressure, obviously, to leave that job was very present. And I, how, how long did you do it? Uh, I did 12 years of it uh, from 21. Yeah, since I was 21, basically. 12 okay. years of it uh, until it uh, it became unsustainable. Uh, I, uh, I I was moved around a bit uh, in, within these uh, within this, the, the operational group that I was in. Uh, they cooled me off for a bit by sending me off and uh, to run security for a governor of Baja, uh, Governor Osuna Mian. Uh, basically did security for him and his family. I ran his uh, security. Um, and then I was sent back to the street, you know, after his administration was done. Um, so, you know, you could hide from it all you want, but eventually when you're back out there, you can, you'll see people that you used to know working with you are now on the other side. You know, basically doing some of that. Mm -hmm. um, the people that might have overheard that you have family somewhere 
or people that you might, you know, probably went to a party somewhere and they ever heard that you were dating somebody, you know, this type of stuff. And obviously it just becomes unsustainable. Um, and also uh, during the last parts of my career, uh, all of us were put through extensive background checks constantly. Uh, polygraph exams, uh, the psychometric to see if we're crazy or not, uh, uh, surprise house visits. Uh, they would talk to our neighbors if we had any that that, that could that they could talk to. Um, and this was done on a yearly basis. All of that was kind of ruled unconstitutional uh, during the last parts of my career. Hmm. So a lot of the people that were fired uh, as cause of not being able to pass these exams, some of them five years in the past came back. Yeah. <laughs> Rehired uh, full pay, back pay. And all of a sudden you see these guys show up in their, you know, uh, Hummers, you know, H2 Hummers uh, in the parking lot and just like, hey, what's up? Like, holy shit. <laughs> we're, we're, this is, we're back to square one, basically. Um, yeah. And, and so, I mean, are, are we just in that much of a worse position now than we were t- 10 years ago? I, I think mean, I, so I remember living in San Diego. So I was in San Diego from 2006 to 2016. And there was a period, I don't remember the exact years, but it felt like around 2010, maybe earlier than that, maybe like 2007, where you were not allowed to go to Tijuana. The the, the drug wars then were, were really, really bad. Um, yeah. I, I've never was, actually been to Tijuana, even though it was a 15 minute drive. Um, yeah. I've been south of that, but, you know, we drove through it. But, um, I've never even actually been there. Uh, and, and then it, then it was more stable years later. Um, back, back then when I was active, it was open warfare. I mean, it was, uh, it was 12 executed young men without their heads uh, on the freeway. It was uh rolling firefights in the middle of the day in downtown Tijuana. It was shootouts in castle like compounds that they had. Uh, they, there was a shootout called La Cupula shootout. Uh, and they basically took this uh, stone compound, uh, big house they had, and turned it into a platform for shooting. Uh, the army, everybody showed up for that one. They were trying to shoot down a helicopter. Um, it was a uh, movie level stuff, you know, it was like stuff that you didn't perceive to be reality. It was just happening right across the border. Um, so right now, the violence in Tijuana specifically has changed. It's mostly. Uh, they're assassinating each other's uh, local sales point, the uh, mm. operatives, basically, the people that are in charge of the local drug market. Uh, a bunch of Americans coming down to count, coming down to Tijuana to live have brought with them their, their some of their habits, and uh, the local drug market is is exploding, and obviously people have interest in that local drug market. So you see a lot of that violence, kind of uh, internal violence between sales points and people repping those sales points and cartels, obviously, behind them. Uh, kind of the same thing you see in Tulu with a lot of the economic migrants uh, during COVID going down there. And now all of a sudden, uh, what used to be peaceful and uh, touristy areas that were kind of secure uh, are going into this whole internal violence uh, as far as people trying to feed the local drug market that r- rule with the Americans arriving. Um, it, it changes. Uh, a, a, big, a, big, uh, a big thing that kind of gets missed by a lot of American uh, how Americans view the the, the 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 conflict in Mexico is that a lot of these cartels are fighting for their local control of their local drug markets because mm-hmm. Mexico itself is a massive user of a lot of the drugs that these cartels produce as well. It's not just yeah. uh, drugs being yeah. sent north. Uh, it, it, there's a giant drug markets in Mexico that are, that are being fought over, uh, local drug markets. That and, you know, trafficking people. Yeah, uh, that's a, that's something we see at the border quite often. Is the, the to the extent that we see these wars going on, I mean, literally see them with within within view. Uh, they're fighting for plazas, you know, these the control of a plaza that has an easy crossover point across the Rio Grande to Texas. Because it, our our estimates, and I'm curious what you think of this number, is the cartels overall make about 13 billion dollars a year from just the human trafficking, just charging people because. They're the only one. The cartels appear to have a, a, a fantastic control over the, the U.S.-Mexico border, and they charge people varying uh, prices for, for being allowed to cross. Yeah, uh, they, they, they'll do their homework on somebody. You know, the, you will be a young individual coming, coming from Oaxaca or from central Mexico or wherever, and uh, you'll meet somebody there that's going to go orientate you 
Like, where do you want to go? Do you have family over there? Do you have a way to contact them? And you're like, yeah, yeah, there's somebody over here. Cool. They'll make a call. And now they're, you're basically abducted. And your family on the U.S. side is going to pay whatever quantity they, they, they can to have you safely cross the border and also have you safely released. That's one way they can make a bunch of money off just one individual. Um, uh, people talk in, people in this country talk about slavery and the history of slavery in this country. Slavery hasn't ended. We have slaves in this country right now that are direct product of trafficking of humans across the border by some of these criminal organizations that operate not only in Mexico, but in the United States. Yeah. Uh, some of these people are sent off to work in fields. Uh, some of these people are se sent off to work in the sex industry. Uh, some of them are sent off and work in other industries, and they are working off the debt they have to some of these criminal enterprises. Um, so it's a giant money maker. Sometimes even more than uh, than uh, uh, drugs. You saw this, uh, and there's no risk. I mean, that's the beauty of it for, for cartels. There's zero risk to this. This is the human the, trafficking side. They don't. Just, just uh, specifically the law enforcement side, uh, Mexico realistically doesn't care about human traffickers. You don't hear a lot of cases of, like, uh, we've caught, the arrested this massive human trafficking organization yeah. or ring in Mexico. It's just not, it's just a high priority. So there's no political or, you know, you know official kind of, like, effort made against them in a lot of ways. It's just not popular. Um, and uh, you see some... I mean, we saw some some horrible stuff on that border, and you know, I'm I'm a migrant as well. You know, I came I came into this country uh, and uh, legally, but I've 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 seen American sentiment and support over uh, as far as immigration and and then and then Americans sending you know equipment, money, and and stuff for some of these migrant encampments, for example, on the border. And I've seen some of these migrant encampments basically take that, sell it in the back, and and buy, you know, things to feed their drug habits in, in some cases. So, or have seen some of those products and equipment sent down in support of some of these migrant communities uh, being put in a storefront and being sold to these migrants. You know, yeah. uh, I, I, I saw I saw a lot of the stuff that was donated during the uh, the last car migrant caravan that made that made its way to Tijuana. A lot of those ended up in a market uh, being sold right back to some of these migrants that were trying to make it across the border um, in the eastern part of uh, the state. Uh, so there's there's a there's a there, I, can, I, I understand the sentiment and the, the willingness to to try and support some of these people that are desperate, that want a better life for themselves and their families, but it's misplaced in a lot of ways. Uh, it's a magnet. It up, it's just it's fueling the magnet. It's fueling the magnet of this of this devastating. Uh, humanitarian problem um that, yeah. that our that our border has become it's easy it's, it's easy to it's easy to say uh, the border patrol is evil uh inhumane uh they're barring these people from crossing uh but it's not easy to, to realize that a lot of these border patrol agents are uh, sons of immigrants themselves uh, yeah. some of them are paisanos you know i've seen how they work I've, I've trained some of them i've seen them pay out of pocket for like twinkies stuff like that for some of these kids I mean, they're doing their best with the little support they have uh and on the other side you see these cartel uh, cartel organizations laughing their asses off uh as far as how easy it is to charge these people to basically do this yeah yeah just and that's why i said it's, it's zero risk this no, is nobody's going to catch you doing that eight thousand dollars each wave of my hand sometimes you know and all they're doing is just basically letting people across a very specific part of the fence and telling them to see somebody over there, just give yourself up. Yeah. You'll be let loose because that's, yeah. that's the American policy right now. And this is, and, and this is supporting a criminal organization that is involved in people trafficking, sex trafficking, uh, distribution and production and, and trafficking of fentanyl into the United States and other now Europe as well. Um, uh, and Killings, torturings, abductions, blackmail, just a bunch of other things that have made life impossible for for Mexicans. Yeah, and this is this, this is why I continue to have this question of like, what you know, if you if you had an honest polling of the Mexican people, what would their opinion of the cartels be, and 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 what kind of sacrifices would they be willing to make? What kind of 
unholy alliances with the American government, you know, guys like me, the guys who you've worked with, uh, would they be willing to to make to to take their country back? Um, but I but I also don't I don't I don't want to veer from our from our conversation about the tactics concerning the cartels. Um, I, I still want to get a better idea of like h- how that was on a day to day basis. Well, what tactics did you find effective in actually going after them? I mean. I mean, was it was it basic direct action, urban warfare? And by direct yeah. action, I mean, you know, just for the audience, I know you know, you know what that means. Yeah. Like you said, you, you've trained with NSW, you trained with our guys in Coronado. Um, what I mean for the audience is when I say direct action, I mean, you know, your, your typical zero dark 30 going after Osama bin Laden. That's a direct action mission. That's what we call it. Is that effective? Is it is it all of the above? Are you doing like low clandestine kind of uh, intelligence operations? What are you guys doing? Uh, the I mean, there was a reason why they militarize our training and basically turn us into a paramilitary group. I think some of the successes we saw on the border uh, were directly related to the fact that they treated this as a national security military problem and not a policing problem. Uh, the Mexican government goes back and forth as far as what it wants, you know, does it want a civilian police, uh, very much in the form of a national, uh, Policia Nacional of Spain, or does it want, uh, uh, a national guard unit, which is very much militarized and going after these, uh, criminal groups, uh, with gunships in the sky, shooting down at them, um, mm-hmm. and what is effective and what isn't effective, um, um, in my point of view, it being a policing problem has not been the case since uh, the early 2000s. Uh, these are organizations that uh, outnumber some of the local police precincts at times. Uh, these are organizations that utilize uh, guerrilla warfare and uh, guerrilla warfare tactics. Uh, some of them are trained by uh, ex-members of the Caibiles, the Special Forces Unit from Central America, and some of them have uh, have ex- been exposed to training by former members of the IRA in some ways, in shapes and forms. Uh, the utilization of drones and uh, explosives on drones, uh, up-armored vehicles, um, 50 cal, uh, uh, 50 cal uh, rifles, uh, Barrett rifles being utilized in some of these operations. Uh, some people laugh at them because, you know, they're not using any sights on them, but I've seen some people uh, and some of them with sights on them that have been obviously been marked by people that know how to use them. Yeah. Um, so uh, in this last arrest attempt, uh, in this last uh, operation to arrest uh, El Chapo's son, you saw a passenger plane being strafed with gunfire by cartel forces yeah. with people on it. I mean, this is the level of violence, and you can't tell me that you're going to send a community policing force after these people. It's just, it's just, it's just not the case. You would need, uh, you would need to basically implement, like you say, direct action uh, mission type things, militarized direct action mission to go after some of these these, these forces. The problem with Mexico is that a lot of it is centralized. Most of the people that come out of these special forces units and groups uh, come from a specific part of the country, which is central Mexico. So once you take them out of the places where they're familiar, you they become lost, which is a lot of the things we used to do was basically guide them around some of the cities that we knew about hmm. um, and operate with them. And, um, and, then, and then their question, of course, is can they trust the locals driving them around? Because yeah. So it's, it's, it's so it's so highly likely that they're on the take. So we would get put through a bunch of uh, exhaustive uh, confidence and, and, and background checks uh, constantly. And they worked until they did, which, you know? which doesn't happen anymore, which is, is, is unconstitutional. And, uh, what, and it's, it got, got rid of all of that because it represented a different presidency. So what what, what is some of the most heinous tactics you've seen the cartels use? I mean, there's there's really there's really no limits anymore. Uh, during the time that I was coming up, the early 2000s, we saw the advent of social media and uh, and videos. Uh, we saw videos of people being executed and I, people out there yeah, listening to this have probably gotten some of those videos on there by some horrible friends uh, send, sending in some of them stuff or them finding it on social media when social media wasn't as restricted as it is now. Um, you would see these uh, highly produced uh, torture videos of people being mm-hmm. executed in different horrible ways. Uh, these actually inspired ISIS fighters later on. Uh, I think there was a lot of cross traffic as far as uh 
people from the Middle East looking at some of those videos and realizing that's a pretty viable way of exporting terror. Uh, yeah. I mean, you can kill somebody in a field somewhere and nobody finds out about it. You can video it and put it on social media and that projects that uh, right. that action. Um, and uh, I mean, the the recruitment of basically child soldiers uh, that a lot of these criminal groups have, which is forced uh, recruitment of some of these uh, kids. Uh, that you then find executed on the side of the road. Some of these kids, uh, I remember this one kid had his uh, name sewn into his underwear. That was that was an indication of age, you know. Hmm. It's pretty horrible to see some of the ways they end up. There is no heart. There is no line. There is no rules. There, there used to be probably back in the 80s or 70s where families and women and children were off limits. Uh, but I've been to places where babies were executed. Uh, as part of a, as part of a, you know, payback. And, and and how does that level of depravity happen in a Western society? It, it's actually uh, having operated in the Middle East and dealing with this fanaticized Islamic terrorists. It, it's easier to see how they, um, how they justify it in their minds, right? Yeah. They, they 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 use this sort of infidel complex where it's it's you know it's it's actually it's they they convince themselves that it's according to their own religious teachings it's it's fine it's okay to do it as long as to, to an infidel how does how do these criminal organizations b- become these sort of mass murderers i mean how does how does a human mind become that and how does that relate to sort of your your research which we alluded to in the very beginning of this conversation on your research on the occult and uh and that that aspect of a mexican criminal culture i mean uh mexicans are catholic and uh walking into a catholic church and seeing a bloody body in front of you is not uncommon in the form of a statue so that's kind of there uh a lot of these criminal organizations actually draw people from rural communities so animal husbandry and being able to execute a pig with a knife is not something foreign to some of these people as well uh but specifically i say popular co- programming uh the the uh robin hood complex um the you know, the the ability to glorify and or romanticize the figure of somebody that's robbing from the rich and giving to the poor mm. uh hearing these corridos these popular songs that are made for some of these uh folk heroes uh that are cartel members uh that glorify their actions and their and their lives and their deaths sometimes and uh and talk about some of the heinous things they do in a very nonchalant way. Uh, social media, uh, feeding their minds from a very young age as far as seeing somebody blown up uh, with dynamite in the middle of a field or somebody getting uh, a group of women getting killed with a shovel. You know, what, is, what does that do to somebody as far as what they view as normal? And then further on, you get into some of the occult aspects of, uh, of uh, the spiritual practices that some of these criminal organizations have. Um, a lot of people get freaked out with the Santa Muerte aspect of it. This, this uh, veneration of death uh, as a figure that uh, that's pretty harmless in a lot of ways. When you see people that have actually practiced that and kind of go about that as a faith, it's uh it's very much Catholic. It's almost Catholic uh, folk Catholicism as you see it. What, uh, what freaks me out sometimes or what I see out there that it's kind of worrying. It's uh, some of the Afro-Caribbean influences that you see some of these uh, organizations get. Uh, what I mean by that is uh, spiritual workers or people working within these uh, criminal organizations, basically hiring themselves out as people that can cast spells of protection and, mm-hmm. and curses of this kind and um, utilize body parts and uh, utilize cannibalism in their rituals, uh, utilize uh, uh, certain aspects of blood uh, rituals and torture uh, of their enemies for some of the things they do. And I think that's not specifically Mexican. It's uh, something that has its ties and roots in things like Afro-Caribbean uh, spiritual practices that have come into Mexico, things like Palo, Mayombe, um, some elements of Santeria. Uh, people can tr- people can research themselves and go back to uh, uh, the los narcos el narco satanico, which was a, a guy that uh, was basically a freelance uh, spiritual worker for some of these cartels that eventually got caught because he murdered an American student because he wanted his brains for a specific spell to put into his uh, ceremonial pot. Uh, this is this is a level of under 
an underlying level of darkness that is basically kind of out there. Um, you'll see it expressed in different ways, shapes, or forms. It's something that it's it used to be like hidden, uh, but now you can encounter videos of people eating hearts <laughs> online. Uh, I mean, some it's, of pure, it's, it's wild. It's pure evil, and um, it, it goes so far beyond. I think. I think what the mistake many people make is 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 assuming that these are all businessmen, and yeah. right? Is that? I mean, I'm sure it's a mix of both, but it's 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 a. Uh, it's everywhere. It's uh, like spread. Uh, it's there's definitely an there's definitely an underlying current of that at all at all levels, even in the government. Uh, uh, you hear that uh, you hear rumors of each of the presidencies in Mexico basically having their head uh, spiritual worker of a sort. Mm -hmm. uh, you see uh, members of uh, certain members of cartel organizations uh, trying to make themselves out into a saint, a folk saint, after their death. And having their, their their bodyguards basically enforcing people to venerate you, you know, in that way, shape, and form. So there's elements of that versioning across the country in some of these criminal organizations. This uh, this uh, missing spiritual component that a lot of people that want to label Mexican cartels as a terrorist organization, and if they want to compare them to, let's say, ISIS, you know, they that that it doesn't match up in their in their mindset as far as what a terrorist organization could be. Um, but if you look at them, I mean, they have the political interest there. Uh, political assassinations in Mexico are at an all-time high. Mm -hmm. And it's usually because one cartel is supporting one political candidate and the other one is supporting the other. So they're obviously politicized and political. Mm -hmm. um, you see them adopting uh, terror as a tool you know, by ex ex exporting their, uh, their message through videos, uh, through song uh through action uh, uh through going into a town and murdering every single military age kid there and just leaving a town full of widows and uh, old ladies um or just leaving a town with nobody uh, there's been a bunch of cases that of like that in central mexico where just whole towns right. were basically eliminated um you know this this whole conversation and this is a conversation that's being had in mexico as well uh this uh this 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 looming fear of the United States labeling them terrorist organizations, uh, cartels as uh, terrorist organizations and the countering of arguments. And I get a lot of heat because I, I, I basically agree that they are in their own way, shape or form. They, they absolutely are. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, <laughs> but no I get question. a lot of, I get a lot of heat and a lot of uh, criticism because I say that because they say, well, it's just an open invitation to be invaded by a foreign country. If you say that, well, well, first off, cartels have been transnational since the, since the 70s and 80s. Um, yeah. it, you, there's an argument to be made that the Sinaloa cartel is actually a, is actually an American cartel because the head of the Sinaloa cartel historically, El Mayo Zambada, learned his tradecraft in the U.S., in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. That's where he learned how to do what he does. Um, the concept of a wall and them being in Mexico and us being safe in the United States is not really realistic. I mean, they operate in public lands growing illegal marijuana uh, yeah. in all over California. We're, we're seeing cartel hits uh, throughout the U.S. too. I mean, so, I mean, what's your assessment currently of, of, of cartel presence inside the United States? I, I think, uh, you know, there's been a few studies done as far as uh, gang on gang violence being lowered by cartel presence in the United States, basically them coming into the United States and taking over some of the local drug markets and calming things down, hmm. which there is, there is a, there is an argument to be made for that. Um, I've seen members openly uh, open members of some of these organizations in the United States. As I travel across the country, uh, Vegas is one of those places where they just openly walk around. Um, you see a stabilized drug market where the prices don't lower or raise, even when you have a militarized border, like during the uh, during the migrant caravan um, or during COVID, you saw a pretty stable uh, supply. So it means that somebody's in control and there's not a lot of competition for that control in parts of the United States. Uh, I think they've been here and have been here for a while and they're embedded in different industry and uh, they may be in it's not, not be surprised if they're politicized as well in the United States. Um, basically what happened in Chicago with the uh, mob, but at a nationwide level is what I see as far as 
might happen later on. If Do you think that they've infiltrated? I don't want to get too conspiratorial, sure. but do you think that there, there's these pro-immigration groups that um, are obviously very left-leaning? They, they control a lot of the narrative when we try to have a, de- a honest debate about immigration and border security. Um, you know, pe- people always say, you know, it's the politicians in Washington that don't want to solve this problem. I actually don't think that's true. I think it's the far left and far right nonprofit groups uh, that 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 make their money literally every single day by ensuring that this problem never gets solved. I wonder how much cartel money goes into some of those groups that, that, that their entire mission is to perpetuate uh, that magnet, uh, that draw for illegal immigration, which of course enriches the cartels. Yeah. Is there any I mean, evidence not, of that? I mean, it's not, consp- it's not conspiratorial to say that the cartels best interest is in the, it's in the best interest of cartels to keep immigration restricted and to keep drugs illegal because that's how they make their money. I mean, that's not conspiratorial to say. Um, and people furthering that uh, furthering that narrative, I think, on a state side. Um, where are they from? You know, who? Yeah. What blood ties do they have? Uh, who are they to be uh, to be working in some of these uh, in some of these areas and be politicized in that way? Um, these uh, in Mexico cartels have learned the lesson specifically. I've seen the lower cartel is very smart about the politicizing itself and how it supports the town populace. Basically, you go somewhere, you don't mess with the locals, you are friendly and nice, you pay for schools, you support uh, immigration uh, lawyers to get people across and earn favors. Very much mob era, mafia style. That's their mo. So it's not surprising to me that the, they they find uh, you know giant money laundering operations in the garment district in places like LA where $50 million were found or, or, or some absurd amount at some point in the past and how they basically hide within local Im- immigrant populaces because this is where they are. They're at home. So it's in their best interest to, to kind of like keep some of these p- people happy and support them. Um, it's for the status quo and how things are right now. It's, it's fine. You know, it, it, yeah. you know, it's not, it's not a, it's not a problem uh, for most. Um, the problem is when the new generation cartel uh, surpasses the Sinaloa cartel, which if you see it now and some of the historical hits that they've been taken recently, as far as some of their leadership distribution arms and how it's being fractured uh, from the Mexican side, uh, What's going to happen when that new generation cartel gains control over a large segment of that border, a corridor, and they make it across? What do you, who do you think they're going to fight for control? And that's, I think, that's when you're going to start seeing Mexico level violence stateside. Really, uh, I think there's there's a there's a it's coming. I mean, as far as their expansionism in Mexico and how they've been growing. Um, if you if you if you have this uh, new generation cartel take over a large segment of that border and have control over access points, you'll see them in the United States, and they're not uh, they're not like Rob they're not Robin Hood characters. They're very militarized, no nonsense group of people that will just come in and clean out. This is how they operate. Hmm. So it's that's I think that's it's not conspiratorial to think that that's where we're headed. Uh, I think uh, it's scary as far as the the mindset that a lot of people have again that the threat is down in Mexico and it's yeah. not up here. I think and, it's and, already- that, and, and I think some people wrongly believe too that it won't come up here because again these these guys are such logical thinkers that the last thing they'd want to do is 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 trigger us um, and 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 which would be bad for business right if if you have a if you have a very intense whole of government coordinated attack from the the american government it would be bad for business but it's you're saying it's not clear that they think that way or at least they think we just won't do anything they- well if i just we like i do training across the country sometimes i go and speak at law enforcement uh, organizations and and every now and then i step foot in some of the police academies uh the United States is losing its police. Uh, mm-hmm. Recruitment is down. Um, go to these academies that are almost yeah. empty. Nobody wants to be a cop anymore. Right. Uh, people right. are aging out, opting out. And uh, whatever confidence the United States has as far as 
none of this will ever happen will ever happen here because we have all of the, the the police here is this and that and we just went through years of corrosion as far as the police right. and, uh, organizations yeah. and it's and funny they, that and, and they're aware of that the cartels are aware of that i mean they are savvy they pay attention you know uh they you know they look at distrust or basically abandonment of police uh, policing uh, groups in certain parts of the country and that's where they move in i mean you can you can you can you can trace a lot of what's happening in places like seattle mm-hmm. and um and uh what happened uh what happened in portland during the riots and how people moved in took advantage of things as people were distracted with, with right. stuff that was going on the, the, these these guys see opportunity there but hey, real quick, back to the conversation about terrorists, because I, I do want to actually expand upon that, you know, because while I agree, they're definitely terrorists. Um, I, I personally have concerns with an actual official label, uh, a designation as a terrorist, simply because it makes our immigration crisis that much worse. Um, you, yeah. you, you, you create this and uh, you create this new class of, of asylum seekers, refugee seekers, because, but, you know, for, for obvious reasons. Yeah, basically, you give people that have. Uh, they're fleeing Mexico now a legal path to claim right. asylum in the United States. Right. Yeah. Which that, that's... Uh, on, on, on my end, I think it leads to a conversation about immigration reform uh, uh, of some sort before you even approach yeah. basically that designation. Well, well, it's why it's why you know, I have bills that, you know, because the designation just means authorities. Right. It just means we can go after them in a certain in a certain way. And contrary to maybe what the conversations are in Mexico, it doesn't mean we're inviting you're inviting action. We can take the action anyway. We don't have to call them terrorists to take action. We we need some kind of authorization. So I have two. I have, I have multiple pieces of legislation that give that authorization, and we'll we'll get to that. I'm kind of curious what you think of it and what 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 we should be doing. I mean, as as American policymakers, what we should be doing. We'll we'll, we'll get to that. But you know, the the thought process is, uh, I do want people to think that we're actually going to take action. <laughs> I mean, I I do want them because I because in the end, I don't I don't want. American Navy SEALs down in Tijuana, you know, bashing heads. I mean, I, I'm neutral about it, but, you know, it's, it, I want the Mexican government doing it. That That's what I want. I want Mexico to be a stable, prosperous place. That's ultimately what we want. And I would think that would be a popular sentiment among Mexicans. I know they don't trust us, but yeah, you know, how do we, how do we break that barrier? And, 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 and give me a little bit more insight, if you don't mind on, on those kind of internal conversations. You know, so the Mexican people don't want them called terrorists, but do they want them gone? I mean, if 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 your your average Mexican, if they could snap their fingers, would they would they say no more cartels? Would they? Yeah. I, mean, I would assume so, right? But it's yeah, like uh, it's, it's it's a matter of costs and what it takes to get rid of them. Yeah, there's there's very loud voices that are pro cartel on social media. Uh, huh. TikTok is a fascinating look into the soul of Mexico right now because that's Mexico is all over TikTok. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have. Uh, you have army, the army basically doing uh, mocking TikToks against the cartels, and the cartels doing mocking TikToks against the army. You have recruitment videos uh, by cartel forces as far as come and join us, and uh, you have people smugglers advertising their services on TikTok in the open for everybody to see. So you can see clearly that nobody is doing anything about it. Um, Mexico's fractured. Uh, a big part of Mexico is very to the right conservative. That is just culturally true um and uh families are very important uh, the work ethic is high uh but uh some of these criminal organizations and groups have basically taken hold over the youth and uh the conversations and and uh and the way they basically politicize themselves as far as being the robin hood characters of society um and if you haven't been living under a uh, threat and fear uh, of some of these criminal organizations, I mean, it's safe to say that if you go to Mexico now, if you go to Tijuana now, and one out of 10 people, if you ask them, hey, has your life ever been threatened or affected by cartels? They'll talk about one of their family members being abducted. They'll talk about somebody uh, robbing them at rifle point somewhere and taking their car. They'll talk about somebody walking into their business and extorting money for the uh, 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 of them uh, every month 
to keep uh, their business from being burnt or them being shot. It's a very common thing all over Mexico. So a lot of them will say, yes, you know, we need to get rid of this problem. Uh, the solution, they don't trust the government of Mexico. They don't trust the police in Mexico. Some of them don't even trust the army anymore, which was a vast unit of trust in the past. Uh, they don't trust the United States. So it's basically, I guess, a conversation of how do you get to these people and make them trust you? Or what uh, what type of conversation could be had directly with them instead of the political class or the military class in Mexico? That uh, How can you get to have a direct conversation with Mexicans is what I'm saying. Yeah, I don't know. That's a hard one. That's a hard one to kind of figure like, out. Sounds like we need a TikTok account, which... Uh... <laughs> which which we banned <laughs> yeah. in America, yeah. rightfully so. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, but and again, and, and that's interesting. Just as Americans, pay attention to what TikTok is in Mexico and how it's being utilized, and what is what is being put and fostered as far as what shows up on a feed. Yeah. If people don't think TikTok is being manipulated or used as a tool, Mexico is a very interesting. Uh, case example of how it's being utilized and what's being fostered or shown some of these feeds, you know? Yeah. Well, okay. Well, that's interesting that, 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 that gets into the question that, that, that gets into the modern era. I mean, I, I largely have, I've been talking to you about the past 20 years. What's different in the last few years is the fentanyl issue. Yes. Like that's yeah. certainly what, what gets policymakers attention. You yeah. know, there's, there's, there's a certain status quo that people can live with, with your typical drugs coming over. We don't like it. Um, but as long as it doesn't create, again, urban warfare in the United States and mass death, um, I, I think people have, have, have historically turned a blind eye. Fentanyl is different. It's gathering more attention because you got almost 80,000 Americans poisoned a year. And this is very different than a drug problem, in my opinion. And I think yeah. most people's opinion, because you're people already don't even realize they're taking fentanyl most of the time, right? They, they, it's added to all of these other drugs to make them more potent and more desirable. Um, it's cheap. So it's just, it's a good business deal for the dealers. And so you've got a different situation now where I view it as, okay, the cartels are knowingly murdering 80,000 Americans a year. To me, that's, that's a, that's very clear. And so our actions have to be clear in response. And so that's, that's the change in mindset um, that, that, that I'm seeing, that, I, that I'm personally perpetuating. So, so I, I remember when I first started starting operationally, marijuana, you know, these hay builds of marijuana and, and weed presses and, and prosecuting people for weed and all that. And uh, these fields being covered in weed and you know, burning it in the field and then wanting to smell it and wanted to eat M&Ms afterwards. And it was all fun, right? It was a it was a great it was a great time, a big waste of effort. Basically, um, legalization happened in, in California, and you saw a change. You saw a change not just on the border, but like everywhere. They realized that uh, that was gonna that wasn't gonna be a profit for them anymore. At least growing it in Mexico, they still grow it illegally in the United States, uh, though. Yeah, which is which is pretty interesting. But that's uh, what I keep hearing. Like they've they've still found a black market. There's still yeah, like a large yeah. black market for all of these uh, drugs. Legalization doesn't change that. The 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 weed legalization, and again, I'm it's a, I'm fine with weed. It's fine. <laughs> uh, the legalization of weed basically created a giant market for them of for trafficking for moving illegal weed in the United States. And also all this cash that can't be processed regularly through banking systems has created a big opportunity for them to pile their own money in there and, uh, you know, wash yeah. it. Interesting. I didn't know that. Uh, Colorado is a pretty, there's a lot of cases, examples of them basically tossing their money in there in California as well. Um, the, the fields used to be covered in weed are now covered in poppies. Uh, some of these, some of this ground is leached of nutrients, so the potency of these poppies and the heroin it produces is pretty low. So somebody at some point, somewhere, gets the idea to basically lace it with fentanyl. Now, fentanyl historically coming into the country is usually something related to the Sinaloa New Generation Cartel. And the reason this is is because they have control over the Pacific side ports, which are the first ports you get to from china um there has been recently investigations made of actually legal 
medication on store shelves in Mexico and pharmacies that have been found to contain fentanyl in them, which is very telling because it means that uh, some of this fentanyl trafficking and its use now in bogus fentanyl pain medication that is now showing up all over the United States um, is actually tied to legal industry in Mexico related to the pharmaceutical industry. There is something going on, uh, a direct tie between China, their output of fentanyl and fentanyl-related products, and the pharmaceutical industry in Mexico. This has been the case for a while now, but it's it's pretty clear now that it's very overt and in the open in a lot of ways. Uh, 128 million doses has been just uh, found uh, in possession of what probably is a Sinaloa cartel affiliate somewhere in in, 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 in the state of Sinaloa by federal forces in, in Mexico. That's enough to kill everybody in the United States. Uh, during, COVID, during the COVID epidemic, the Sinaloa cartel was trafficking fentanyl from California into Mexico because they didn't have access to their regular supply. The, the new generation cartel, on the other hand, grew exponentially in, more, in, in, in their control over market and their output as far as production. Why? Because they have access and control over the Pacific side ports of Manzanillo. And even during the shutdown of COVID, you know, fentanyl was still coming over. Um, it's interesting to think, you know, because people say, well, you know, criminal enterprises in, in China are doing this. That's not how China. That's not how China works. Uh, there's no, there's no independent criminal organization in China making mm-hmm. a deal with uh, these cartels or making some sort of a permissive r- drug route or permissive uh, supply chain into Mexico without them knowing about it. So there's obviously something happening in China uh, related to a lot of laboratories as far as supply goes that they're just turning a blind eye to or not yeah, or purposely. fostering. I mean, why, why wouldn't you want to destabilize your greatest adversary? Yeah. It, it's very and, easy. And that's the uh, supply chain. And on the other end, a lot of these criminal groups have been utilizing Chinese banking system and banking apps and money, money men from China to move their funds around. You know, once money goes into the Chinese banking system, it becomes invisible to US eyes. Yeah. So this is another interesting aspect of their involvement or their you know complicity and l- allowing some of these things to ha- to, to just uh, flow and, and the tiktok uh, the tiktok thing as you said was very interesting and I, I i didn't really respond to it but i do want to expand upon it it's it, it seems rather obvious again if you're if you're into information operations and you you, you have this gold mine of information and, and this ability to to kind of drive the public narrative you would and your goal is ultimately to destabilize your, your biggest adversary, the United States. Well, a pretty good segue towards that goal is to de- destabilize uh, Mexico, an important U.S. ally and, and partner, So, which is much easier to do given the, the factions and divisions, as you noted, uh, that, this, that they represent themselves on TikTok. And so, I mean, is it your opinion? It's hard to prove this, of course, but I mean, or maybe you can. Is, is your opinion the Chinese will will obviously uh, promote, amplify more divisive narratives on on TikTok within Mexico, maybe from the cartels themselves, just to create. The, how, how do you think that works? I don't know. Just basically the proliferation of some of these criminal groups openly doing what they do on TikTok. Mm-hmm. Uh, the the conversations that are being had and it being a soundboard. I mean, uh, at one point, the business I have tried to start a TikTok and it was banned immediately because I posted a picture of a knife on there. Uh, but somehow these uh, a bunch of cartel kids shooting up into the air at a cartel party is allowed on TikTok. Or a uh, human smuggler promoting their services with a WhatsApp uh, phone number on there. Um, saying, uh, interviewing people that are already on the US side, their face fully in view, like, where are you? Uh, I'm in Houston. Uh, these guys did a great job. Thank you for getting us across. Uh, and that's 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 on TikTok. Now, the what I'm saying is that it's interesting how in the open it is and how Mexican authorities don't do anything about it and how it shows up on feeds constantly, even of people that are not into any of this cartel, illicit activity, promotion of one criminal organization over the other. Uh, 
it's interesting. Like uh, my niece, you know, she's into dance videos and she gets some of that in, on her feed, you know? Really? Uh, it is, it, 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 it's an interesting aspect of it that I don't, I haven't seen a lot of people talk about it. Uh, uh, it's definitely being utilized by all sides as a tool of information and propaganda, even the government. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, seeing how some of these criminal organizations are like show up more than others on, on that, uh, on that uh, social media account is, this is something to kind of look into, I say. So, you know, let's talk solutions here. Um, this has been a depressing conversation well, for the most part, right? <laughs> so about, uh, about the problems. No, no, it's it, it's good. I mean, it's a conversation I have often. And, um, but as far as solutions go, like I said, I, I mentioned some of the um, solutions I've promoted at, the, at the, the higher policy level, you know, higher, for instance, I have one bill that, that imposes uh, higher sentencing for cartel members, uh, ability to go after their financing, uh, authorization to sanction Mexican officials who uh, aid and abet cartel members. So we basically stole that language from the terrorist designation. Okay, so we just don't call them terrorists. And there's again, there's we already went over the thinking behind that. And then there's then there's um, what I'm trying to get some Democrats to agree with me on is an AUMF against the cartels, an authorized use of military force. Doesn't mean there's going to be bombs dropping in Mexico tomorrow. Of course, if the president signed that, it's still up to the president uh on, on what you would do with that but i i firmly believe we're at the point where you at least have to uh threaten that possibility with some authority because tens of thousands of americans dead is a very different scenario than like we referred to before hail bays of weed being being pushed across the border it's a very different scenario one is extremely deadly one is not and one is warfare one is not and um the the nexus with china it makes it all the more infuriating and so, but what else can we be doing? Or, or do or do, do you disagree with that tactic? First of all, <laughs> do, you do, what, do you think we're I going that we're, we're barking up the wrong tree? I mean, I'm just desperate at this point, to be honest. I mean, I mean, if you, if you want to go after finances, I mean, you have to. It's interesting. The garment industry in LA has a lot of it has direct ties to some of these criminal organizations. Mm -hmm. Hollywood, Hollywood. Uh, uh, somebody uh, supporting them financially. I mean, there's a bunch of tequila companies related to some of these cartel organizations that uh, also support uh, some, you know, national teams out there. Like, to what extent do these networks of uh, influence and money go? Uh, I agree that uh, some of these uh, some of these uh, corrupt officials should be held accountable for what they do and who they foster. Some of them are doing it in the open. I mean, current president AMLO has been photographed in video talking to El Chapo Guzman's uh, mother and lawyer. Hmm. Uh, he's, he had a message from El Chapo Guzman, who is inside of one of your supermax prisons, by the way. He had a message from El Chapo Guzman delivered to him by a reporter on national tv i mean what does that mean you know what what what, what, is, what does that mean to uh to sentiment and just confidence in in uh in our authorities um you 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 you, you i think there's there's a there's a clearly a, a an almost uh you know untouchable aspect to some of these uh politicians uh, Felipe Calderon, the one who was in charge of the administration when I was active, is currently somewhere in hiding uh, as this, these uh, legal proceedings against his uh, Luna are happening in, in New York. So obviously there's fear there. Um, you know, I, I think, yes, some of who's, these people have to be. Who is, he, who is he hiding from? Who is Calderon hiding from? from the US probably from the, right. and whatever investigations are going to stem from this uh this proceeding uh, against his uh former basically top cop uh mm. a man who was who was applauded and celebrated by the FBI the, the DEA and the US government in general i mean there's a picture of him and Hillary basically shaking hands um this is the guy that is now on trial for uh, cartel connections and receiving money from one of these criminal organizations um, it's, it's the first indication that the people are touchable, uh, uh, uh as far as Mexico, Mexicans are paying a lot of attention to that case yeah. because they, they're, they're looking at, oh, see these, these people can't be God. Uh, so there's, uh, 
some positivity on that end. Uh, but uh, what about the rest of people that have gotten away with things? You know, right. what about the rest of them that uh, what about the general that the, the, the DOJ basically let, let go to be processed in Mexico when he was accompanied to his house and yeah. he lives comfortably down there? Um, what can be done? Uh, uh, I think, uh, you know, what doesn't get talked about a lot is the uh, the seeming, uh, the seeming, uh, the seeming uh, cultural and mental separation of the United States and Mexico that a lot of people uh, talk about sometimes at, on on both sides of the political spectrum. The last time that went into an all time high was during the Trump administration, and I think that did a lot of damage to relationships, uh, the relationship of the United States and Mexico as a whole. Um, what, what can you do next? I mean, if any money is being sent down to Mexico, like this uh, former uh, Merida initiative, mm -hmm. uh, it should be audited and looked at with a microscope. Because right. I know for a fact I was a recipient of a lot of that aid. I know for a fact that a lot of that money got... It needs Christine. it needs to it needs to come with I mean you know when we did the when we do this in Iraq and Afghanistan that money comes with actual Americans there on the ground um that's the the presence of Americans on the ground in Mexico has always been limited and if if I, if, if I could sign that check I would put a I would put something in there that would say this check is a twenty year plan with certain goals it's not mm -hmm. five years it's not six years it's not uh, twelve years a twenty year plan. It doesn't matter who's in who's in who's in uh, who's in that presidential seat. Doesn't matter what its politics are. It's a twenty-year plan of these of stabilizing Mexico as a whole, and going after some of these criminal enterprises on both sides of the border because it's a regional problem. I think if you can figure out a solution that is treating this problem as a regional problem, uh, and has some sort of plan that is set basically in stone for twenty years instead of the five. Uh, six-year uh, type uh, policies that have been basically taking U.S. taxpayer money and putting it into the furnace um, and basically restarting over and over again. We are about to end, I think it's a year and a half of this, this current presidency. We're about to end the bloodiest presidency in the history of Mexico. The under I mean, Omlo. The, under Omlo. And it doesn't mean that he is worse than the other presidents before him. It means that all of them are bad. This is not. Yeah. A, this is like all it's of them. It's just been bad. escalating for years. It's, and it's been escalating it, for years. I mean, also, it can't help when his entire campaign slogan is "abrazos no balazos," right? Hugs, not bullets, and it, it, it just, it just, it, it is a signal to an enemy that you're not going to do anything about it, and they have free reign. Yeah. Is it not? Yes, and now you're seeing. I don't know. I, this is not conspiratorial to say, but he was pretty surprised when, in his uh, press briefing, they were that he was told about this military operation to arrest uh, Oviedo. Really? Um, yeah. They didn't so tell. it's alarming. You know, it's alarming uh, that so, he uh, does it, it. It seems that the army is operating on its own in a way. Uh, we just went to our through our version of WikiLeaks in Mexico, uh, the Wakamaya leaks, which was a major leaking of forty million documents uh, of the Mexican army, where they detail how they are involved in political espionage, uh, how they have accused certain members of rival government officials as being cartel funded and operating, working with cartels how they themselves recognize that certain parts of the army are working for one side or the other in certain regions of Mexico. Wow. Uh, and all these things are in the, you know, in the open, in the wind, there's no denying any of this anymore. It's out there. Um, this is something Americans don't quite understand about Latin America history and, and culture and politics is that the military in most countries is this almost like a separate political entity that can sort of, decide to take over at any point and that Latin America just has a long history of that in general. I think, um, I, think just... I, th I think that factor in Mexico as a possibility is very much there right now. It's uh would that be better for the US at this point because it doesn't seem like anything else is working. It's 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 an interesting question. I'd say um uh, it might be. Uh, 
it's just who in that who in that uh, structure are you going to trust you know um and what are their you know intentions and and and, and uh and, and this is know. why I, I talk about this problem in terms of incentives. Like I, you know, in the end, I even see Amlo as as a as a guy who weighs costs and benefits. So you know, how did Trump get get Amlo to agree to the Remain in Mexico program for the immigration crisis? He just threatened him with tariffs. Yeah. You know, and and Biden got him to agree to it too. But Biden got him to agree to it by giving him something. Okay, so it was like an equal the immigration. It goes thirty thousand U.S. takes thirty thousand Mexico takes. Okay, so. Clearly, this is a person who just operates on a very basic incentive structure, um, which is, I, I guess, a good thing. It means it's predictable and um, that there's not a whole lot of ideology sort of infecting that thought process. And, you know, this is which is why which is why I gravitate towards these sort of threatening stances, not against Mexico. I, I don't want to threaten Mexico prosperity. I want to threaten the cartels that are hurting both Mexicans and Americans and and I want Mexico to take a look at that and say, I'd really rather, I'd really rather you did not do that. We'll do it. You know, that's, that's what I want to see. Now I'm curious. I mean, what if, what if, what if, right. What if tomorrow Biden did a drone strike on a, on a, on a rural facility that's producing fentanyl uh, in Mexico? What would the reaction be? You think, I mean, where, what would the precipitation of events go from there? Maybe that's, maybe that's too much of a crazy hypothetical. That's, that's, that's a pretty, that's a pretty crazy one. And I, you know what it would happen tomorrow as far as Mexico uh, relationships with the United States. I mean, obviously it would it'd be a shit storm. Um, it, would be, it wouldn't be good. <laughs> it wouldn't be good. Uh, which cartel? Sinaloa cartel? They'd probably take the hit and not say anything. New generation cartel? It would probably be some retribution. Hmm. Um, and how cartels? They, how, yeah, cartel. That's interesting. Cartel, how how would they do that? I mean, uh, criminal organizations and cartels are well aware that they are in charge of the border. If you want, uh, so if you're, if the United States feel th threatened about its southern border, it's not going to look for the Mexican authorities to police that border for not getting things across. It's probably going to talk to some of the criminal elements down there, which control the border. So that's alarming in a lot of ways. Uh, they know well enough that if they lower the potency in a drug load uh for a few months and then they raise it that's a pretty good way of exterminating a large segment of your population hmm. uh so they can weaponize the fact that they are the ones that are giving you these uh substances uh that, that can utilize it as a tool it's not something that is in the realm of the impossible they've done it in local drug markets before um so i can i can view like a very extreme arm of some of these criminal organizations that seems or views itself being attacked to so start utilizing some of these taxes to pressurize the U.S. government to be hands off. Like it's, it's, yeah. they do it to Mexico, the Mexican authorities. Right. So I can view these. It, it sort of, dep it depends on who's level. in charge. I think they could probably bully Biden into backing off, but you know, you, you, you got a Republican president in there. I think it's war. I mean, I, you know, I'm certainly of the opinion that it needs to turn into a war. And um, you know, I'm not afraid of that, but the I'm curious though how I get the Mexican government to to agree with that and and invite us in to be partners in that. And um, you know, is it is it a carrot or a stick or a mix of both? Obviously, it's not like just <laughs> blindsiding them with a random drone strike, right? That's sort of an yeah. extreme example. But we have to talk about it like it's a possibility to get them to the to get them to talk to us because yeah. as of now they don't they won't even engage with us in a really meaningful way uh again 20 year check uh with stipulations and and, and goals yeah that doesn't that uh relies heavily basically uh, i'd say relies heavily on the military leadership aspect of it people that were verified and checked up on by the US there's ways mm -hmm. i know that i mean they did that with us Sure. Uh, there are people out there that I trust that I, that I think uh, could do a lot of good for this country. <laughs> and the only, these people are usually in hiding and running from the uh, current administration. Uh, you know, there's a, again, uh, as uh, as I started my conversation, I mentioned a mentor of mine who I just recently interviewed for, uh, uh, for a podcast that I do. Um, he is like if if the U.S. was looking for somebody that exemplifies what you need as far as leadership in Mexico, there he is. Mm -hmm. uh, he's he's somebody that uh, has not only done the work on the ground, but is wants to do the work politically and become a 
a member of the uh, leadership in this country, and he's being barred and stopped at all <laughs> in any way, shape, or uh, form that they can politically, legally, criminally. In, in Mexico uh, or here? But, in Mexico. In Mexico. Uh, yeah. uh, so uh, the, the Lieutenant Colonel Lazola was he's, he's regarded as a savior character mm -hmm. in a way. He took down violence in Tijuana and Ciudad Juarez to basically taking these cities off the most dangerous cities on the planet list. Uh, so he's some he's somebody that you can basically sit down and talk to and actually gain a good understanding of what it takes to rescue parts of Mexico um, hmm. and well, see if you can do that actually at a at a at a larger scale. Well, I'd love you to, to put us in contact. That would be, definitely, I could definitely do that. There's a lot. There's a lot of um, appetite for this in in Congress, at least on the Republican side. There, there is quietly on the Democrat side too. The problem is, is it gets so politicized because they're so they're they're they're, they're the, the the border issue, the immigration issue is so taboo for them. They will not. They will not agree to any solutions on that. And and they they and they know damn well that the cartels are a, a, at the nexus of of all of those issues and so they won't touch it in a meaningful way and it's very very frustrating but quietly they they definitely understand the national security threat and um it's it's in all of our interest to to get a hold of it uh you, yeah. you, you, you know you can imagine a world where if mexico becomes a stable thriving place uh because there's so much potential there for the for the reasons we, we stated at the beginning of this conversation you've got an america's as a, as a, as a hemisphere that um, can can never be beaten, right? It, China China collapses eventually, um, just because of their demographics, and, and and other bad decisions I think they've made over time. And and we can prosper. It's 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 a it's a unique situation that's being hindered by this one problem, you know. The, and, and the the timetables are this: you have an aging leadership in the Sinaloa cartel in the form of uh, El Mayo Zambada. He's going to die of natural causes one day. There's no clear person that's going to take up his uh, leadership position with his experience and with his ability to control things. You see a fragmented Sinaloa cartel, and you see a, an expanding new generation cartel taking control over vast amounts of the territory in, in, in Mexico. Mm -hmm. So what happens when that Sinaloa cartel collapses or implodes? Mm -hmm. so now you see this other criminal organization that is not Robin Hood. <laughs> It's uh it is uh kill everybody that is willing to fight and move on. What happens when that what happens when that becomes an issue? And that's that's around the corner. At some point in the next five years, maybe more, but you'll if once you see uh once you see these criminal organizations, uh this criminal organization and the new generation cartel take control over a big part of the border, this is when you're gonna see that uh that's when you're going to see that normalistly switch. Yeah. I mean, how is their mindset so different? I mean, because that, that's this really interesting dichotomy. So the Sinaloa cartel is what I guess more of a classic cartel, kind of the Escobar style, where uh, like they, they, they go after their enemies in a ruthless way, but they also seek to gain the hearts and minds of the population. They'll build roads, schools, that kind of thing, just like Escobar the, did. They, 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 they know well enough to keep the locals happy and not, not mess yeah. with the locals and... Uh, you know, build roads and help people out and be community and be political. Basically, they're, they're politicians. They're yeah. politicians in a way. Uh, a new the new generation, Jalisco. <laughs> that's the Jalisco. Jalisco. I, I, I always say Jalisco, but okay, it's, yeah. it's new generation, the proper label for yeah. them. Cartel de Jalisco de Nueva Generación uh, yeah. is, the, the, is their title. Um, uh, one thing I noticed as far as the difference between them is their, their recruitment their kind of uh, focus on training, uh, the people that they bring in to advise for them. There's rumors of uh, former American military personnel advising them on certain aspects of what they do. Uh, there's also, uh, they, they've been, they found IED uh, facilities where they're trying to figure out how to manufacture uh, explosive devices uh, to, to attack their rivals. Um, and have have they succeeded in that, or are they just still trying to experiment with? It? No, uh, I mean, there's uh, they've done it. They right? they've successfully dropped uh, uh, explosive mortar rounds uh, with chemical loads on Mexican army personnel in places like uh, Michoacan. 
Michoacan, the state of Michoacan right now is where most of the avocados in the United States come from. <laughs> so if you're into the, into that, that's a that's a that's where your avocados come from. It, it, there's trench warfare happening in Michoacan right now um, between Mexican federal forces that allied themselves with local cartels in the form of Carteles Unidos Jeez. and the new generation cartel that's trying to gain an entry into this place. Uh, so who's the good guy the, in this in this scenario? <laughs> like. Uh, that's, that's an interesting question who the good guy is. Um, the locals don't want the new generation cartel moving in because they're aware of how they brutal they are and how they're going to take control over everything and probably going to take a mass, massive amounts of the money generated by some of these avocado orchards into their own pockets. Mm -hmm. Uh, they're utilizing drones to not only look at the enemy movements, but also dropping bomblets on, on, on them, uh, in the form of. 40 millimeter grenades stabilized something they learned from watching ISIS videos probably. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and now they're utilizing mining level explosives with a payload of the, uh, I think it's pesticide chemicals that they're utilizing. So they're not only exploding, but they're also dispersing some of these chemicals into the environment. Right. Uh, these are, uh, th this is, they uh, they train in a militarized fashion. They have these, right. you know, like what reminds me of the old school videos of uh, Al Qaeda training camps with the monkey bars and stuff like that. There's versions of that out in Mexico right now on their end, you know. Really, uh, and they seem to be very good at recruiting people. Uh, we just saw a massive exodus of federal agents uh, during the start of this administration when he dissolved the federal police. The federal police is no longer a thing. Uh, it's replaced by this military uh, National Guard unit, which is basically just army guys dressed in uh, urban camouflage. And they didn't take uh, the police and move them into that unit. They just made them unemployed men with training and knowledge, which is we learned that lesson in Iraq. It doesn't work very well. Uh, uh, people, I train government agencies and the military in the United States uh, in a very amount of things you know how to survive in foreign environments how to how to figure out uh, how to get things how to supply yourself how to do a lot of interesting things that i learned just by working in that environment also by the training that i received by us and other foreign entities there were a lot of people like me and people are impressed with my skills and i tell them well i used to work with a group of 80 people and i don't know where all these oh, i don't know where the rest of them are when we were defunded and basically sent on our way Mm -hmm. uh, where are they? You know, these these uh, people with operational experiences, training, they know how to they know how to they know how to run an optic on a rifle. They know how to think, shoot things far away. And they know how to operate uh, different types of explosives. Some of them, you know, some of them have a military specific background. Where are they now? And the answer is that a lot of them are being recruited by some of this some of these criminal organizations, specifically the new, new generation cartel and. This is how they're expanding. You know, they're very good at recruiting and basically augmenting their capabilities with some of these individuals. So that timeline you laid out, I mean, it seems pretty inevitable. Um, uh, El Maggio has to die at some point and they will fracture and a new generation uh, makes its moves. It, does, does that, maybe I'm being too optimistic, does that create a backlash at least within Mexico? Yeah, um, I mean, it's, I don't, it's it's a weird thing right now. You're seeing the army step up operations against Sinaloa. Uh, people were thinking that they were probably trying to get rid of some of the smaller factions left behind by Chapa Guzman in in Sinaloa. Hmm. But then, you, but then you're seeing arrest of El Mayo Zambada affiliated figures, which is another. It's basically the leadership aspect of the Sinaloa cartel, the historic leadership aspect of it. So it's, it was El, El Chapo was El, El Chapo was part of Sinaloa. Was yeah, he, it's, but, it's, he, but he wasn't the leader. El Mayo no. has been the leader for this whole time. El, El, okay. El, El Chapo was never, I think, probably number three or number four in the scheme mm -hmm. of things. He was painted yeah. as somebody bigger, but he was he was a flamboyant character. Definitely somebody that knew his trade. He mm -hmm. left behind a few sons that were that keep his operation going and uh, and a uh, brother. Uh, but they are locally relevant, not interna not not internationally relevant. Lumaya Sambada is the one that's historically been the the man that runs things at a at a, at a transnational what's his, scale. What's his lifestyle like? I mean, does he have a big mansion? Does he have many big mansions? Do 
Is somebody I, I, tracking him at all times? I mean, is he just is he I, really good at staying under the radar? I wish I wish I could tell you, but I have no idea because this is a man who's never been arrested. He's done a few interviews. Uh, he is a very much a question mark. He is somebody that supposedly learned his trade by uh, former CIA operatives that worked uh, uh, around Cuba during that during the uh, Bay of Pigs uh, situation and had so experience in that. Uh, He's, a, he's an older gentleman. Uh, he the, the 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 history behind him is that he learned a lot of his trade in Los Angeles, uh, and uh, you know it's a it's a an open rumor out there for a long time that he is under some sort of agreement with uh, some U.S. authorities as far as him being an asset of some sort, which I don't know if it's true or not because that's beyond my uh, level of uh, experience. Uh, but he's never been arrested. Uh, he's never been captured. Uh, they say he lives in the Sierra and he gets moved around a lot and he has a giant protection team with him. Um, uh, he has definitely basically skirted the, uh, the, the attention of, uh, of authorities uh, for years. Hmm. Um, but in a lot of ways, he's been a stabilizing force uh, yeah. as far as, as far as what happens cartel wise in Mexico. Um, when he's gone, that's going to create some changes, I think. Good changes or bad changes, we we don't know. Just uh, just changes, nonetheless. Um, yeah, hey, I, I I said I was going to keep you for an hour. We went about uh, two hours, which I, I kind of had a feeling we would because um, this is a, a fascinating discussion, and your 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 history is is incredible. Your your knowledge base on the issue is incredible. We could probably talk for hours more, um, and maybe maybe we'll have you back on if you're cool with that. Um, to, to, to do just that as as these situations develop um because uh it, it, this this problem isn't going away and um you know there, there are people like me who who want to spearhead a solution to it but we got to do it right and we got to be smart about it um first first goal is getting uh, american politicians on the left and the right to actually agree uh that there's that there's a problem and that it needs to be solved and um and then figure out how exactly to do that and uh we may be calling on your hunter expertise time and time again for for that so i appreciate you thank you thank you uh thank you for the platform thank you for allowing me to kind of speak on some of these things uh i went through a lot down there and i am in the united states now and it's a great country uh, I came here with nothing but experience and uh, and just a willingness to do something with it. Uh, it's been fascinating to me that I left something in a hurry. And for some odd reason, that's what I have to go back to as far as trying to figure out a solution. Uh, I uh, There's not a lot of people like me that went through what I went through uh, down there and can speak on it. Uh, but there's a lot of good people down there, uh, a lot of good people in the fight. Uh, they're just voiceless. Uh, you don't hear a lot about them because they usually don't make it out. Um, there's good people in Mexico. There's good people in politics as well. Uh, they're just uh, persecuted and on the run right now because it's not popular to be anybody with any good ideas right now in Mexico. And I think it's a pretty good idea to find these people. Uh, there are friends down there. They just they just have to find. I hope so. Um, and that should be our goal. Ed, thank you so much for uh, being on. This was great. Thank you.